Buzz the Economist. Buzz the Economist. I wanted to do a quick video, but it won't be quick. It's going to be long. I got this feeling. We're days away from an election, and although I don't talk politics, I do want to talk about some experiences, some education that I've had over the years um, that tell me how things have been going, and maybe uh, we can see how it's going to look in the future. But without getting into politics, you know, both sides are really hyper about all the things that they're saying right now. And, and, uh, and it's a shame that it's gotten to that point, but that's the way it is and we have to deal with it. Um, we've also had to deal with surprises like COVID. Um, who would have thought? Who would have thought, if we think back four years ago, who would have thought that uh, we could be in a situation like that? Um and then just recently with the hurricane in uh, North Carolina, who would have thought you call that a hundred year flood? And I know we were buying, trying to buy property. We were looking at when we were younger, 30 years ago, um, the Rocky River, there's a street down in the Cleveland Metro parks. Uh, there was a house for sale and we looked at it, brought her parents over to look at it. And we thought about buying it. They weren't keen on it, but it backed up to the Rocky River. And the problem with the Rocky River was there was a shale, probably 50 feet of shale going straight up on the other side of the river. So if we had a 100-year flood like they did in Ohio in 1913, we would lose our house. So we thought about that and decided that that probably wasn't a good idea. When we bought this house 30 years ago, we actually looked for the plans to see if we were in a floodplain. We were so uh, worried about, <laughs> once we got that in our heads, we were so worried about it. So when I see, you know, the people in Asheville and other areas where even small creeks turned into huge torrents of water, um, you, you just can't imagine that that kind of stuff is going to happen because, it, as they say, it's a 50 or 100 year flood. And uh, you just can't think about, it. you know, you don't think that that's going to happen to you. So... We've gone through that. All of us have gone through some type of surprise. The COVID being the biggest one because it affected everybody, right? But the economist, Buzz the economist, okay? I, I listen to a lot of different things, and I don't have an answer to anything. I can just tell you from my experience, right? So I don't have an MBA in finance. Um, I was a B and C student. I tried to, uh, I was working right out of high school, and I was working 10, 11 hour shifts. I tried to go to the Cuyahoga Community College. I was actually taking police administration because I wanted to be a, a cop, believe it or not. So, but uh, even at a young age, I couldn't handle, I couldn't handle going to school, working second shift, 10, 11 hours, trying to catch a few hours of sleep. And I know people do it, but trying to catch a few hours of sleep and then going to classes. It was tough, and uh, I dropped out and, and uh, couldn't, I couldn't get the associate's degree. So, but I worked all my life, and I've seen, and I got close to the business side of a factory organization. And I can tell you, uh, just like in your experience yourself, uh, when you go to buy something, right? And, and we can just bring this all the way down to my level, okay? <laughs> When I go to buy something, and I'll use me as a prime example, I'll compare two different products, right? And maybe read some reviews, et cetera, et cetera. And the one made in America is usually the higher cost one. Like there's a gene company out there, um, and their jeans are, you know, 47, 57, 67 dollars. So they're higher priced than a Walmart or a Sam's Club or a Costco. And as we all know, the reason for that is because you're the lower price normally, not always, but normally is because it's made overseas. 
So the more things we buy from overseas, and you know, the clothing industry has disappeared from America, basically. Um, you know, we always want that cheaper product. And I see that in housing with uh, roofing. You know, there are roofing companies, good roofing companies that have gone out of business because they, because they cannot compete with some of the low-cost labor that some of the owners of roofing companies are using. Now, when I had my roof put on, he paid his people a good wage, a good living wage. That upped the price of my roof compared to others by 30%. And sure, I could have went with um, a company that used lower cost labor, but I decided at that point not to because of different reasons. They hand nailed my roof, they didn't use staples, just a lot of different things, and, and they turned out to be excellent. It was probably a, the best decision I made with the house. But that's what we do. We're always looking for the cheapest the less most less expensive way to do something and unfortunately that leads us into buying product that wasn't made here in the USA and I'll give you a good example of when in my work life you know just a, these are real life events because again I'm not an MBA I'm not a finance guy that sits on the sidelines and says well this is what we should do this is what we should do and they may be right but I see real life I saw real life what was happening in our business. Now we were a factory, we were in manufacturing, and again, I got to see, you know, talking to the controller, I got to see some of the business side of it as being a small company. You know, we had to make a lot of different decisions. I was one of the major decision makers during COVID. You know, do we force people to get inoculated? Do we, you know, shut down? Do we do this? Do we do that? Uh, luckily, we had a UAW there um, who had a safety committee, so we would meet and discuss what's best for the employees. But we were also under, had military contracts, and military contracts have to be fulfilled. That means you had to have workers there when most people were sitting at home, at least in Ohio. Um, so we had to make a lot of decisions. And one of the things that happened after COVID and even before COVID, but more after COVID, was companies trying to retain their people. Um, in our company, Amazon opened uh, a couple miles away, and it got to a point where almost every three to four months, companies were advertising 17 18 19 $20 an hour. They were trying to outdo each other, to get the factory help, uh, which, you know, Amazon sucked up a lot of people. So general labor people, there weren't too many around who wanted to be in the workforce. And so you saw this competitive wage thing, and that's great for the people. That's absolutely great for the people. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. And anybody that goes and gets a different job and they can better themselves in pay, I'm all for it. And I've told many of the people who left our company, good for you. Unfortunately for some of them, they went to Amazon and they worked them. <laughs> and their uh, uh, attendance policy was a little more strict than what we had. So we had a couple come back, but not, not that many, but a couple. And then you have other companies. And we were in tool and, uh, tool and die and manufacturing. So tool and die guys, uh, and we didn't have any women who were in tool and die. But the tool and die guys, you know, they could just call up another company and say, hey, uh, how much you paying? You know, I have 10 years experience. How much would you pay for that? And it used to be in most places, 20, 25, 30 dollars an hour. Well, they started seeing 40, 50 dollars an hour and people left. So the competition was really high. So what am I getting at? When you have to pay more for people, you have to, and you want to keep a certain profit margin. Now, we won't get into, like, some of these companies, their profit margins, they want, you know, 30% or something, whatever. And at each company decides what their profit level, profit margin level should be. Ours was a certain 
profit level that we wanted to maintain. We weren't asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars, but we wanted to, to keep the company going so we could reinvest into new equipment, etc., which most companies try to do. Well, we found that the problem was we were paying more and more and more. And I said we had a UAW, so every contract that came up every four years, uh, we would negotiate and end up spending more and more because of the economy, the inflation. So they weren't asking, again, for the sun, the moon, and the stars, but they wanted a good living, which is understandable, but we also wanted to keep our profit margin or we would close. Many manufacturers in the Cleveland area closed for various reasons, but the labor was really hurting us. So what do you do? In the case of a, of a manufacturer of food, let's say, which affects most of us, right? <laughs> They have to raise their prices, right? Or shrink their product because they're paying more. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the greedy profit side of companies and this and that, and because uh, I don't know, you know, what companies, you know, take how much profit, etc. But it's just common sense. If your electricity's going up, like in your house, your electricity's going up, your gas is going up, your all your utilities are going up, uh, internet costs go up. Uh, all the things that you need, your your health care goes up, um, all these things raise. So you have to do one of two things. If you're working and sending product to a customer like we were, you have to ask for more money per part that we're sending out. Or in the case of uh, a food manufacturer, they have to raise prices. So a lot of it stemmed because there wasn't enough people. So then that gets into the immigration side, right? Because like in, in Ohio, where I live in Cleveland, you know, you've heard about Springfield. Well, the Haitians there are working in one of the factories. They have their temporary visa cards or whatever they call them. And that's what they did. And in our case, uh, through a temp service, we were even asked if there's a temp service that's in Mexico and we could bring the same type of workers over. Now it wouldn't be at the at the size of what happened in Springfield, but we could bring five, six, seven people over um, from Mexico and we would employ them and find them housing and do all that stuff. So that's going on in the United States a lot. So because there are so many different people who don't want to take factory jobs or uh, chicken plants or stuff like that. So it's it's a real big circle of issues. Um, and it's not as easy as what some of these candidates or both candidates are saying. It's just not that easy. So, and when they get into all this, this and that and this and that, I kind of tune it out because I just know that from from my standpoint, it's better for me to buy more American type product and and I'm so guilty of not doing that because I'm guilty of of doing the same thing as a lot of people you know Walmarts are packed Walmarts carry non-American product for the most part and as, as much as we buy that uh, we're just hurting ourselves so um, it, it's it's a very <laughs> it's a very vicious cycle let me tell you but I, I'm just going to be glad when all this is over with and either party that wins, it's still going to be a struggle. We're still going to have surprises. Um, there's things that are going to happen. And, and it's, it's very interesting if you're a, if you're a person who loves history and, and loves current events, if you love them both, it's a very interesting time to be living. You know, and people said that in the 60s, right? With all the tur turmoil that was happening in the 60s, a little, albeit a little different. Um, the 70s, you know, you had different things. The 80s, you had different things. Um, so it's, we're not, we're not, uh, it, it's nothing that we haven't seen before. It's just escalated to a, almost an eruption type <laughs> situation now. But 
let's hope that once this election is over, then all we have to worry about is our Medicare, <laughs> the Medicare ads <laughs> until uh, mid-December, I think, or whatever. But, yeah, so the economist buzz. <laughs> I'd like to hear your comments without getting political. Let's not get political, but, you know, you MBAs out there, let me know what you think about the economy. Um, hospitalization. Uh, you know, we, my brother, real quick story, my brother was, uh, he worked in the Air Force, retired from the Air Force, and uh, he ended up taking a, a security job. And he was uh, working for uh, a sheik who actually came from Saudi Arabia. And he bought a mansion because once or twice a year he would have go to the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. So he bought a mansion nearby so that when he flew in, he would have a place to go. And he couldn't just get a regular house or take a hotel or anything like that. He actually, he actually bought a mansion. That's how much money this guy had. But the point being that the United, he came here to the United States for the health care. And that tells you something. So when you look at things and you go, oh, things are so bad. No, we have the... The, probably the greatest health care in the world. Even though it's expensive and it's so red tape and it's so BS, um, and that may never get solved, but we do have some of the best health care in the United States, uh, in the world, I should say. And, and that's a good thing. So you have health care, you have the economy. Um, I already talked about the economy, but there are some good things that are going to be happening. And we all together will get through this like we have for since we were young, right? We're going to constantly look at ways to do things better. We're going to hopefully get together a little bit more. And, uh, and hopefully everything's going to work out. But anyway, Buzz the Economist, just breaking leaves today. <laughs> thought I'd throw this out there. Have a good day. Have a good week. Take care.